I'm Lee Brown. This is Crazy Shed in Real Estate. And today I've got Matthew Ablican all the way from America's Hat, also known as Canada, to talk about his investor journey and his journey as a practicing realtor as well. He is delightful. We're going to have a little rabbit hole down what we can be doing to support people that are oppressed. I mean, it's kind of a wild episode. I think you're going to enjoy it. So tune in, buckle up, and I'll see you on the other side. You're listening to Crazy Shit in Real Estate. You'll be amazed at all these wild but true situations that others have found themselves in. Because on this show, you'll hear uncensored, unbelievable stories from the world of real estate. I'm Lee Brown. Let's dive right in. Before you get the rest of the story, I'd love to share a quick message from today's sponsor. If you've never heard of Follow Up Boss, you're going to love it. And it's going to get you organized in a way that will actually impact your business for profitability and for better excellence with those you're serving. For more information, go to followupboss.com slash crazy. Matthew, tell my people where you are located and what you do in and around real estate. Give them a little bit of insights. So we are from, we're in Canada. We're from Ontario, one of the, the most important provinces in all of Canada and specifically in the GTA, which is known as the Greater Toronto Area. So it's, it's one of the most buzzing cities in all of Canada and all of North America. And I started very simply when I was 19 years old, I bought my first property and then I became licensed as a real estate salesperson. And then we've grown the company to a group of companies. So we're a real estate brokerage, we're a mortgage brokerage, we're a life insurance agency. But my focus was always invest in real estate. So we were you know earning a commission and putting it back into different types of real estate. And we don't come from any family background where there's money, where there's they're in this business. My parents both came from the Middle East to Canada from the same place, but they escaped for different reasons uh, pertaining to like persecution and things like that. Um, a lot of persecution still happening in that region, but they came similar stories, met here at a local church, got married, had my brother and I, and the rest is history. So my, their background is their wiring is very very different. When when my mom sees what we do, she's always like she's sad about it. She's like, I don't want you to be doing this. I want you to be a teacher. I want you to be a lawyer. I want you to be salary. And the reason why is because they were teachers back home. The credentials didn't uh, transfer over, and they became entrepreneurs not by choice, not necessity. because it was the cool thing to do, but because of necessity. That's interesting because you seldom hear about people that are entrepreneurs by necessity. Usually it's that dream pathway, but your mom really wanted you to have what she could no longer deliver. And that's pretty emotional. So for all the people in Alberta and Saskatchewan that were about to leave snotty comments about how you're the best province in Canada now, you have to be nice because now there's an emotional story here. So I'm I'm so curious because this will totally rabbit hole us, but obviously right now we're recording this at the end of September 22, and there is a massive uprising happening in the Middle East right now over women's rights. So I'm very curious about how you perceive that now as a Canadian looking back over the ocean and knowing what your parents went through. What is your emotional reaction to that? And what are you doing in, in the community to be a support? So that's exactly why my parents left. And again, they never knew each other there. They happened to be from the same place, but they met here. And a lot of people from my community left to come here because of that persecution. And you know, I, a lot of it is political. A lot of it is religious. A lot of it comes from a lack of education and awareness, to be honest, and control. Always people want to control one another. People want to control the resources. It's a rich, rich area, especially with oil. And there's always that system of control. And so my parents, when they were living there, had to adapt and become accustomed to the culture and the traditions there because otherwise the reality is that you know they, they would get killed. So it's their life that's at stake. And when my mom had to leave from Iraq and then they lived in Iran, which is where the, the uprising is happening, where, where that lady was, was murdered, they had to, her and her sister and all the women in the family, they were fully dressed up and were not from a Muslim background. They were fully dressed up. They had to do that. They had to be, I guess they had to be accommodating to the country and what the, the laws were of that country and the traditions and the rules. Otherwise they would be murdered. And that's been happening a long, long time. 
And yeah, my heart goes out for them just because we're not from there. We're from, we're from Canada. We're born in Canada. I understand the parents struggle. They've told us the stories. We're fully aware of that. And it's a shame that somebody had to die for people to really wake up because that's been happening every day. She was the brave one that did it in a public setting. And unfortunately, you know, before it got, it, sh- it shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have gotten to the death right. part of it, but you know, maybe that's what it took. And, and now I, I heard Saudi Arabia just changed that rule and, and they're, they're coming around, they're coming around. So it's unfortunate she's not here, but she's one of the pioneers that paved the way for the woman. Yep. Becomes a legacy. And it's so funny exactly. because our young people today, they have concocted this set of first world problems that is not a problem when you look at a real struggle like we're currently watching in real time, but also the lack of contextual history behind it. So many people don't realize this is the same struggle that's been going on for literally thousands of years, and it's not a reason to let it continue being an oppressive society, but there's an opportunity to support and uplift. So if you're one of my younger listeners or viewers get out of your blinders in your bubble and pay attention to the bigger world and also start thinking about how you can be a voice for somebody else when they need you to be their voice. Because that's frankly what we do in real estate every day. We are somebody's voice when it comes to their piece of their home ownership dream, their business ownership dream, their financial stability of the future through investing. So when you are somebody's voice, you are in that entrepreneurial space. So let's talk about, we'll come back now because I had to rabbit hole because it's it's top of mind right now. And yeah. and frankly, it I think it really does shine a light on how fortunate we are where we live to have the freedoms we have that people like to make up problems and we shouldn't be making up problems. We should have more gratitude. And so when you're in that entrepreneurial space, you kind of have to live by gratitude because you're going to have seasons of plenty and you're going to have seasons of want. So what drew you into an entrepreneurial space knowing that there were other stable pathways what was it about real estate that sucked you in at the first? So there was a few influences in my life. And one of them, my mom would always force me to work. Like I started my first job at 14 years old. I love your mom. Yeah, She's my favorite. Me too. me too. She really is. And she ended up forcing me to go to work, not to pay her own bills, but to just build those disciplines and those habits in my life. Right. And so I was working, I was making money. I started getting access because of where I was working. There were other businesses in the area. I started getting access to some of their products and some of the things that they had. And so in high school, I would have two lockers and I would have like backpacks and I would have hair straighteners and I would have dog tags and I would have like all kinds of things that I could sell. And I was always making money. And that was something that I really enjoyed. So when I got into into university, I started becoming like a waiter and a bartender at two different places. American companies, actually. Johnny Rockets. I don't know if you guys have them in North Carolina. Well, we have them in South Carolina down in Myrtle Beach or the Johnny Rockets. Yeah. yeah. So so I was waiting tables there. I was waiting tables at, and bartending at Lucky Strikes. It's a bowling alley, pool, bar area type of thing. And that was always great for me because I was getting a paycheck and then I was getting tips. It was kind of like the side hustle sort of thing. Yeah, it sure and, is. Yeah. So when I was in high school, there was a teacher who was a real estate agent. He was a really bad teacher and he was a real estate agent. He wouldn't do anything except, yeah, open the book, read whatever. And that was it. And he'd be on the computer. And then he was the type of guy where he would have his commission checks. And I remember him showing us a commission check for like 30,000 bucks one day. Wait wait a minute. How old were you that this dude showing you his commission checks in the classroom? I was in grade 11, so 16, 17 years old. Yeah. 16, 17 years old. That's how we attract people into real estate. Tell me y'all's eyes didn't just bug out of your head. You're like, holy yeah. smokes, are you serious? Yeah, it was all the money in the world at the time. And I was like, man, this is great. And and this guy's a teacher and he's earning this and he's earning that. Like that was unreal for me. So when I was 16, I bought my first uh, mutual fund. I was invested at a, a bank called President's Choice. And we ended up just putting like a thousand bucks into mutual funds, 2000 bucks. And then I had a high interest quote unquote savings account with them. It was at 1%. And I just was like rolling in money. That's huge. Right. And uh, yeah, I wasn't, it wasn't sufficient really to pay for anything, but as I got into university, like I had to pay my own tuition and I graduated with zero student debt. I I had no love your mom. She's my literal favorite here. She made you get some sense of purpose and achievement. 
Yeah. Well, she had no money to pay for tuition anyway. So even if she wanted, I bet if she'd have had it, she'd have still told you to work. I can feel it in my bones. She would never have paid your way. No, no, for sure. And so when I was in university, I'm I'm paying for my own tuition, and then I'm doing two degrees. So I'm I'm undergrad. My undergrad is in law. I'm doing that concurrently with Teachers College. I'm working these part time jobs, and I'm like, how do people get ahead? Like, I'm not getting ahead. I don't have. Uh, social life. Plus I was volunteering in the schools because they forced you to do a placement in the schools to get experience. How do people get ahead? So I got the light bulb moment for me, the concept, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And the concept that really came to me was earning money while you sleep. And I was like, wow, what is that? Like, let me look into that. Kevin O'Leary was, uh, is a big advocate of that. So I read one of his books I started opening my mind and real estate It was either real estate or stocks and you're getting dividends and things like that. But I I learned very quickly, you have zero control in stocks, a lot of uh, no benefits in stocks like like you have in real estate. And real estate was was a safer avenue for me. But again, no down payment, no experience. You're not a realtor. I wasn't even 19 yet. I was 17 at the time, 18 at the time when I was like starting to learn this stuff. Yeah. And so one of the things we have here that I don't know if you guys have in North Carolina, but a lot of other uh, states, whenever I'm speaking on somebody's show, they, they tell us they don't have this. The pre-construction, the brand new stuff that you could buy off of floor plans, over here, they take years to develop. So if somebody has a parcel of land, and it might take them five to 10 years just to go through the process with our cities and our province to get approvals. And then once they get approvals, they have to go to sell the sell the product. And then once they sell the product, a certain amount, they could get financing for it. Once they get the financing, they can start construction. So if you buy, my first property was a, was a condominium in our area that we, we live in today. And I was 19. I bought it from the floor plans. It's a four-story building and it took four years to construct. So the one it's thing like that in San Francisco is about that bad. Most of the states, it's not quite that bad, but similar to what you're talking about, the problem is the government overreach. It's all these provincial and local government bodies that want every permit and zoning because they are exactly. scheming fees every which way they can. So if you ever, viewers and listeners, if you ever wonder why this stuff takes so long and why stuff is more expensive than it should be, pay attention to the government officials because they are adding on fee after fee after fee, and it gets passed through to the buyer no matter which way you put it. But it also incrementally changes the time frame, and that impacts somebody's ability to have somewhere to live, to build their wealth, to really be able to get their financing in place so they can move on. So there's, it's not the fault of the developers is the long story short there. So I'm glad you pointed that out. But you Canadians, yeah. y'all need to vote a little differently next time. I'm just going to, as my outsider busybody self says, it's it's tough here. It's tough. And our politics is very, very different. So the majority of people did vote differently last time. Unfortunately, the way our politics work, it doesn't mean always that party wins. And it's it's a very weird system. And unfortunately, I mean, we're seeing a lot of a lot the tide changing in real time, even even in the States. It's gotta um, move faster though, because you know it's gotta move faster. Yeah. A, a lot of these things they're doing, you know, they're talking about climate change, they're talking about the war, they're talking about all these different things. That don't have it's to a do. shell game, man. It's yeah. a shell game. Take our yeah. eye off the balls and, and make us fight with each other so that we can't do things that make our families stronger and build our relationships and communities. Yeah. And I'll give you one more example about the municipality thing, because I work with a lot of builders and developers now at Millennials Choice. So I've gotten a lot of experience over the last 10 years working with them. The city of Toronto just almost doubled their development charges. So it's they're talking about affordable housing, yet... To get those building permits, there's these charges and the builders are contributing to parks and schools and other things. That charge gets passed down to the buyer. It doesn't Right, the because doesn't the developer can't profit. eat it. If you don't make a profit, you can't stay in business, but they're going to blame them and their little talking points. It's so aggravating. Exactly. So, you know, there's always the big bad builder. They're in the news. I do a lot of Instagram reels where we talk about different kinds of news articles. And a lot of it is clickbait. And a lot of it is just getting people to want to, you know, they, they want they want your attention, right? So they're going to say anything just to get that attention. The reality is, and I want your listeners to really understand this, a lot of people, they hear this and they get upset at me and they think I'm born with a silver spoon and all that stuff, but I welcome them to shadow me for, for a day or two. It's on you guys to figure out your life and get to where you want to be. It's up to you. 
You know, we, we just moved into our dream home, my wife and I, and, and over here, homes like single family, like 3000 square feet, nothing major. They're 2 million bucks. Like they're not cheap. Like we have a very big problem here in Ontario. All I did to get into that was my second investment that I bought was a townhouse in a major city here. And I flipped it now, seven years later, I flipped it, took all the equity out of there, put it into the home and we're comfortable. That's all I did. I never thought when I bought that second townhouse, though, that that's where it would lead. So these are things that people need to just kind of be a little bit more patient. They need to kind of adapt and adjust their, I don't want to use the word compromise, but, you know, just adjust. Yeah, you, but it's okay to say that. Maybe you're not going to get the Taj Mahal right out of the gate. And you're actually nice. preaching that David Goggins, who is my total leadership crush, where he's like, it's, it's hard. It's really hard work. And you're going to have to suck it up and you're going to have to have some patience. But what you're talking about is not even sexy investing. It's not scary investing. It's a townhouse. So did you have a tenant in that townhouse? And then over time, the equity went up and the rents were paying the mortgage. So what happened was my mentor at the time, which was my, so I bought my first property. And then a couple months later, I became licensed as a realtor. So the brokerage that I welcome. joined. I mean, welcome to real estate, right? That's right. And my whole philosophy was whatever I earn, I'm just going to invest into real estate. And my mentor at the time, which was the owner of the company, would say, just buy one property a year. And if you just buy one property a year, you'll be set. So I'm 19 I at the time, and I'm buying that one condo. And then I bought this townhouse right after. And I started only buying the pre-construction, the brand new stuff. And the reason being is because you don't need the down payment and you don't need a mortgage. So it takes years to construct. So I figured by the time that I would get to that point, by the time the construction's done, I'll have a couple of years under my belt in real estate. I'll easily get the mortgage. So, which is what happened. So I took a chance. I took a big risk. Looking back at it now, had I known everything that I know now, I probably would not have taken that risk. So, but I I was ignorant and sometimes that's bliss and I did it anyway. And yes, by the time closing came around, a couple of years later, it was actually worth a little bit more. That's how I graduated uh, from York University without any student debt. I refinanced the condo, paid off my student loan. And that's awesome. That's how I did it. So every year the values kept going up. But interestingly enough, every year the rents went up too. So this was a new concept. I started renting that townhouse out for $1675 a month plus utilities. Second year went up to $1,800. And then the third year, that tenant left and it was going for 2500 I stabilized it at 2500 for the rest of the term, for the rest of the time that I had it. And I bought it for 390000 back in 2014, sold it February of 2022 for 990000 almost 600 k profit. Some realtors do more business than others, and it's not just their great looks and their charm and amazing hair. It's their follow-up, y'all. People, on average, forget the marketing message after 16 days. Follow-up boss will plug into the system you're using, and yes, they integrate with over 250 different programs to help you get organized with your past clients and with those neighbors that frankly should be your future clients. And if you go to followupboss.com slash crazy, you get a 30-day free trial to go see how this works for your business. I can promise you the people who forgot you didn't mean to, they want to hear from you. So go to followupboss.com slash crazy and you'll suddenly figure out why all these top producers in the market are getting more business. It has to do with organization and detail work and you can get there too. Followupboss.com slash crazy for your 30-day free trial. Check it out. Let me know how it goes for you. So just a caveat here, girl, you know, real estate markets don't always go up. And so you can't always count on the future equity. But the thing about real estate that you've got to hear Matthew saying here is that regardless of what happened to the price of that unit, the rents move. And we know that there's always a need for housing. So if you're new to investing, or if you just need a reset on investing, or right now we're recording this, the markets are very volatile and making a lot of people really nervous. People still have to live somewhere. And so when you own rental properties, you might have to adjust, but usually it's not a long way down because people have to have somewhere to go and there's a limited number of rooftops. So your equity may go up by different amounts, but the rent will still cover almost all the time. So you just got to think about it in different ways and remember that the kind of investing Matthew's talking about here is not wildly risky. This is the blue chip way to invest is the, the very boring 
new unit, which is going to have lower maintenance and repairs, which is another advantage of a pre-construction purchase. And then you're thinking about people want to live somewhere new and nice. That's how he's able to move rents up. But then when you talk about stabilizing it, you're also providing a more affordable option, which means somebody wants to stay put, which reduces wear and tear. So there's all these different ways to look at it. Now, what I'm curious about is as you have gotten yourself financially stable, you got your wife, the current dream house, of course, She's going to want a beach house in North Carolina next. Just going to point that out to you. I'll help you when that happens. But as you're looking at the next steps for the Millennials Choice Group, what are you looking at now? Are you doing multifamily? Are you looking at commercial? Do you buy out of the country? Where do you see yourself moving into the next phase of your business? So I've grown the portfolio to 24 different properties thus far in 10 years. It comprises of commercial, a little bit of commercial retail. I've banked a couple of pieces of land. I've gotten into the resale market and bought. I've bought fixer uppers. Never flipped anything. Never flipped anything except that townhouse. And those fixer uppers were single family homes with the potential to add three units additionally on top of that. So create four plexes. So I bought some stuff oh, strategically. Okay, so yeah. hang on a second. So are you buying like a regular two story house and you're reconfiguring the floor plan to make it a quadplex? No. So these particular. A single family homes were small, about 1100 square feet. Okay. And what you can do is you can either tear down that structure and, and just build a okay. new structure, or you can just build additionally at like added square footage to build three more units. So you know, you cool. can leave, you can leave that house the, the, the way it is. And the reason, the reason for that is because the municipalities all over Ontario, they, they need housing. So yes. they're, they're making that planning process for you know, adding a second suite or a legal suite or whatever the case, they're making it actually a little bit easier for people. And they're, they're waiving those development charges and whatnot. So I bought it because here you can't get a mortgage on land. It's really difficult to do that. I said, all right, how am I going to secure this for the future? So it's like, okay, if there's a structure on it, well, I can get a mortgage on it. And, And those like, for example, August of 2021, I bought two properties like that. They were across the street from each other. One was number 282. One was number 409 on the same street. I picked one up for 345. I picked one up for 360. A year later, one year later, those properties are appraised at about 750,000. I renovated them, yes, but that's not why. It's just because of the need for housing. And they, they have sure. really good, they have really good pieces of land. It's a good land size. So I've I have my hands in a few different pots. Where I see it going, however, the conversations I'm having, the the partnerships that I'm forming, and where I want to be specifically is I do want to be building purpose built apartment buildings, multifamily. I I understand that space the best. I'm already ready for that space. Now it's a matter of just scaling the portfolio. So I'm very open to getting rid of and pyramiding my older properties, getting rid of those properties. And putting it into the bigger project. So I'm still buying in this market. I'm still buying. I'm looking for the deals. We it's hard to find the deals, but that's that's where I see it going. Well, they're out there if you hunt for them. And that goes back to building relationships and communities. So now as we talk about our podcast here, my stories, of course, crazy shit in real estate. My viewers and listeners like to hear the oddball things that you've seen or heard out there as you have been involved in the space. So I'm dying to know what kind of story you brought to the table, Matthew. And I've already taken you down like three different rabbit holes. So (laughs) now you have to come up with something else. Yeah, there's a lot, like 10 years doing it. And I did it very aggressively and built a good business. There's a lot of stories. The number, a, a crazy story that I have from showing properties is one day I went into a property with my now in-laws, actually, and they were looking at this property for themselves to live in. And we were told by the listing brokerage that, you know, there is a cat, so make sure you don't let it out. And that's fine. That's standard. But as we went in there, there were, there were more than one cat. There was more than one cat. There were dogs. There were birds. And I don't know what else there was. I can't remember if there was anything anything else. But the one that I do remember seeing is in the basement, they had a giant cage. And I'm like, if this animal is not in its cage, this is a problem. It was a giant hair, a giant hair. It was huge what? sitting in the basement. And I'm like, what the heck is that? We left right away. Like just my client, obviously my in-laws were like, that's not for us. I don't know what kind of operation these guys are running in their home. I don't know what they were doing. It was, it was crazy to me. 
that this hair was huge. It was the biggest one I've ever seen. I still remember looking at it today, what it so looked like. So how big, like really tall or fat? How, well, how it was, well, it was in its like a uh, cage and it was, it was sitting down, but it was like, if I had to guess the number of feet, it was at least about five feet long. What? At least. Yeah. Huge, huge hair. It wasn't a bunny. It was a huge, huge hair. And I was like, Man, I don't know what they're doing with this. Like, I don't know if they're... Is there rabbit fighting? Like, there's cock fighting, and that's illegal. Is there rabbit fighting? Is it illegal, too? I guess it would be. I think it would be illegal, for sure. But, uh, yeah, it's it was... That's a crazy story. But, you know, I I was listening to one of your episodes yesterday. I'm like, what's something... I I don't want to just say a story just to say it. What's a really crazy story? Like, what do I... And what do I really want to share? And the thing that I was thinking about was what's crazy to me is how much self-sabotage there is out there in our marketplace right now. And what do I mean by that? And one of the things I mean by that is a realtor called me the other day, and I have so much respect for realtors. I know what it takes to to make it happen. But this realtor calls me. There's a lot of ego over the phone. I have no idea why. She's calling me about one of my listings. And she's saying some things that I'm like, okay, I could tell that you may be inexperienced, but I never want to be the guy that's saying, Oh, I've been doing this for so many years, blah, blah, blah. No, I don't. I, don't I hate when guy. people do that to me. Right. So I just said to her, I go, I well, actually, she said it to me. She goes, you know, look, Matt, I'm, I'm actually a, newer to the condo game. I, I do single family. I said, perfect. I said, you need to ask me whatever you need to ask me so I can help you. I'll make this deal work for everybody, but I will help you. And what was crazy to me is, okay, not necessarily her demeanor, but what's crazy to me is how clients will go and, and look for somebody to work with. And, and maybe it's a relative or someone, but they're not the professional. And this is not something that is a small endeavor that you're taking on. That condo might be the only one you ever buy, or it might be the most important one that you buy because it gets the momentum going. You start building a legacy. You need to surround yourself with the right people. A second story similar to that that just happened we we are fifty thousand dollars away from a particular deal. It's a it's a over million dollar deal for my clients. They can easily afford it. It's great for them. They're not overpaying. It's just fifty grand apart. The father is who's really well off. He's putting his foot down. No, because I'm co-signing for the loan, we're not paying the extra fifty grand. And I'm like, you're sabotaging your kid's future Thanks. over something that you misunderstand or something that you've got in your mind or some sort of pride or something, whatever that is deep down there that hasn't come to light yet. And you're sabotaging that. And I just don't understand when people are sabotaging themselves. And that's, that's some crazy SHIT for for your show. (laughs) Or as as they say in South Carolina, some sugar, honey, iced tea. That's how you say that in an acronym, sugar, honey, iced tea. But you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because how many people that you and I have talked to in 2022 or in 2021 who wish they'd done something in 2020 or 2019, but whether it's pride or stubbornness or just this idea that it's something's not right, that they are this close, they never take the leap and now look back and say, dang, I could have had a lower price, a better interest rate, but you'd also be two years further along in ownership and in building that next step if you just take the leap of faith because sometimes it's the leap of faith and that it requires saying, all right, maybe you are overpaying by 50,000, but in the real estate space, if you overpay by 50, all right, so sit tight for a couple of years, you give it a minute, things do smooth out over the long haul. Sometimes you just have to move forward. And, ah, but you know what? The thing that's nice about that one realtor is she gave you the chance to help by saying, I'm a little lost here. And so the consumer public, if you pick that family member who's clueless, go ahead and tell them to please tell those of us that are seasoned that they don't know. We are not going to hurt them. We are going to help make them better because that's better for everybody involved. And I'm with you. I would so much rather that person than the arrogant one that says, I've been doing this for 40 years and I know everything. Nobody knows everything. Ah, That's right. That's right. And and you know what? It's it's one of those things where collaboration is so important in our business and it happens more than people think. A lot of people that come in here thinking it's dog eat dog, they have a they're they're in for a reality check because I notice a lot of people that are confident in what they do, they're great at what they do, they just won't respond to those people. They just won't give them the chance because it's like, you know what, I don't I don't have the time or I don't need the headaches. And unfortunately, that's detrimental to the client. So you guys as clients, you don't you don't want the bully. You want the you want the bulldog, but you don't want the bully. 
And the bulldog is meant to be in your corner fighting for you every step of the way, but not at the expense of other people and at the expense of even their own integrity and things like that. And I've told clients, there's been certain clients that have said, well, go back and say it like this. And I go, hey, if you're going to work with me, then you're not going to tell me how to do my job respectfully. And if you don't like that, if you want to go your route and you think your route works, then you do it yourself or go hire somebody else that, that you can you can tell them what to do. So it's very important to understand that it's a, it's a great business to be in. Lots of collaboration, lots of people willing to help. I've had so many people that have complimented me in my career and helped me in those early years and helped me now. I always call people and say, hey, you got a joint venture agreement I could look at? Yeah, no problem. Matt, we'll send it over to you. Hey, you got this pro you have access to this project. Can I work on it too? Yeah, no problem. And then people do the same thing with me and we reciprocate it. So that we've gotten so many deals for our clients that in the situation where there was bidding wars, bidding wars on properties, even if our clients were paying fifty thousand dollars less, the realtor, because they knew us, because we had access to something they wanted access to, or their client wanted access to, or because they know our reputation and they know we're gonna close the deal. Said, you know what? Our clients felt more comfortable. You know, they took a bit, a bit of a haircut. They they sacrificed twenty five grand, fifty grand, whatever the case may be. They want to go with you guys, and we've won deals for our clients just like that. So your reputation, your name is everything. Be a bulldog, not a bully. That was how we're going to wrap this up because it's so beautifully put, and a reminder that you can do a great job and not be a jerk about it. So. Matt, how do people reach you if they want to find out more about Millennials Choice Group and how they can learn from your Canadian side of things? What's the best way to reach you? Yeah, so just follow us on Instagram at Matthew Ablican and at Millennials Choice. It's I'm very easy to get a hold of. And for your audience, we have something we're about to launch here. We haven't launched it yet, but we just got the first few copies. I actually co-authored a book with fellow Americans, Kevin Harrington one of the original sharks from Shark Tanks and Robert G. Allen, who's a big real estate guy there too. And you're, yeah, you got Kevin's a book, of book over here somewhere. I love Kevin's stuff. Hang on a minute. What do yeah. I have? So this book is um, an international Somebody bestseller. It. <laughs> it's an international bestseller. They promoted it. They, they made it a bestseller on Amazon. And I have a chapter in there. I co-authored it, Six Steps to Financial Freedom. I'm happy to give all of your listeners a free ebook version of it. If you're ever in Ontario, ever in the Toronto Vaughan area, hit us up. I'll give you a free physical copy, but just visit financialfreedomclub.ca forward slash ebook, one word, and I'll share the link with you so that you could, you could share it, I guess, in your show notes. Thank you. That is such a nice gift. Now you tell Trudeau to fix the border policy so that people like yeah. me can get back in and out of your country because I haven't been welcome now for a little while. So fix that for me. You know what? A lot of us aren't even welcome here either. And we're from here. So it's it's uh, something that needs to stop being politicized. I think we need to remember who we are. And, and I say we because it's North America. And well, bring back the love. Bring back the love. Bring back the idea. Like, listen, we're human beings. We bleed the same way. You know, all of our insides are the same. And at the end of the day, whether it's real estate, whether it's, you know, you're a doctor, whether it's whatever, you have to find that common ground. It's okay to be, have opposing views. That's how we grow. And we have conversations and we grow and we learn from each other and all that stuff, but stop politicizing it. Stop creating that division and creating that conflict and all that. Look, you Hang think on. one way. Let me find a microphone I can drop from Matt Ablicam. Boom. Seriously, seriously. It's been, it's been a problem here in Canada, but you know, things are changing. So Hopefully it doesn't stay it doesn't stay this way too long. Hey, it's people like us who fix it because we're bulldogs, not bullies. That's right. <laughs> Matt Applican, thank you for coming on the show. Hey friends, if you learn something or frankly, if you just feel inspired in one of the thousand directions we just took you in over the last 30 minutes, leave him a wonderful comment below. Give a thumbs up and all of his contact information and handles are, of course, in the show notes for the episode. For those of y'all that are nowhere near a computer and can't save it, but totally want to be his friend, go follow friend and learn from him because he is willing to share. And Matt, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate you dropping all this knowledge, including a free chapter from your ebook. So excited to read that myself. And I look forward to seeing you someday on the Canadian side when I come see my Canucks. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. 
All right, guys, we'll see you around. Make sure that you click the button and we'll see you. Okay, now don't forget to go try follow-up boss so that your business can continue to expand in professionalism and then you can meet some more crazy people yourself. I really appreciate follow-up boss sponsoring this episode, but mainly I appreciate them for giving y'all double the free trial time with no credit card required. So make sure you go to followupboss.com slash crazy and then let me know what you think. I'll see you guys next time. As always, I'm so super thrilled that you joined in for more crazy shit. And if you're a realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular human being who happens to have an unbelievable story that you need to tell the world about, or frankly, you just need to one of the story you just heard, then make sure to DM me on Instagram at Lee Thomas Brown or tweet me at Lee Brown or frankly, any social network where you hang out. I'm there. And if you had some fun, then you totally want to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes.